If you have your Bibles this afternoon, I invite you to join me today in John the 11th chapter. <clears throat> the Gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't like to say the Gospel of John. It's not the Gospel of John. It's not the good news of John. It's the Gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded by John the Apostle. He is the Apostle whom the Word of God refers to as the Apostle that Jesus, whom Jesus loved. Meaning the Lord had a special and unique relationship with John. We know from John's writings that he was one of the earliest apostles to understand the divinity of Jesus Christ. He also is the only apostle. Uh, his writing focuses on the divinity of Jesus Christ. And then he is the apostle whom the Lord God Almighty chose to reveal himself to and to write the book of Revelation or the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. So John is a very special character. Amen. John chapter 11 beginning at verse 20. And we're going to read today through verse number 28. The King James text today reads, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. Amen. I want to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Passive and active faith. Passive and active faith. I want to ask you to bow your heads with him in a moment. Master, once again, Lord, we come boldly before the throne of grace. As the Word of God declares, it's our privilege as children of the Most High. We're grateful, God, for salvation. We're grateful for the revelation of Jesus' name. We're grateful, Lord, for the revelation of one God in Christ, and Jesus is His name. Master, the Word of God is so important to the health, the life, the well-being of God's people. And you've called mere mortal men, weak men, human men, fault-filled men, to deliver to your people a word from heaven that their spirit might benefit, that their soul might rejoice, that their faith might grow. And Lord, I stand before you today humbly acknowledging my inability to be anything special. But Lord, today I know God, the anointing can help me to speak something special, something that will benefit and encourage and inspire the people of God and help their faith to find deeper depths and higher heights in you.
Oh, Master, moved by the Holy Ghost today as the Word of God goes forth. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, bring life back into that which was dead. Deliver God from bondage. Oh, Lord, send forth your Word to heal, to save. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. The passage that I read to you today is just part of the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus calling Lazarus from the dead. And a man who lied dead for four days coming out of the grave. Hallelujah. At the word of the Lord. It's an exciting story. There are so many lessons that we can glean. And so many things we can learn from this story. Uh, story, but today I want to focus on something very specific. So I'm not going to go into all the aspects of the story. We've heard it before. I've preached on it before. I'll probably preach on it again in the near future, especially as uh, it looks like God willing we'll be going to a new location and a new place because whenever there's a new audience the Lord sometimes will have me preach you know from passages I've preached on even recently but uh, I want to talk to us today about a very specific lesson we learn from the story that we read here in John chapter 11 I want you to understand today, saints, there is a difference between what I have come to call passive faith and active faith. Passive faith is that underlying faith and confidence in Jesus Christ which we have, which brings salvation. Many Christians, of course, possess this level of faith. We have that passive faith. It simply is that faith we need to be saved. It's as simple as that. Uh, it's part of them. They do not need to work hard to find it or to maintain it. While it may occasionally be brought into doubt by attacks of the enemy, they will not, they cannot let go of the conviction that Jesus Christ is indeed the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, buried, risen again, glory to God, ascended, and soon to come back for His church. But then, there's another type of faith. And I refer to that as active faith. Active faith is that faith which is only employed as we face trials and struggles. Sickness, disease, temptation. It is more transactional as it is dependent upon our circumstance or situation. Many Christians struggle with active faith as their circumstance appears far bigger than God, seeing as their circumstance is far closer to them at the moment than the Lord may appear to be. You see, things appear bigger to us the closer we are to them and the closer they are to us than I tell the truth. Amen. When you're standing 30 miles away from Mount Everest, Mount Everest doesn't look all that big. But as you get closer and closer to it, all of a sudden, it's growing and growing and getting higher and higher. And finally, you get to the peak, uh, to the place where you can't even see the peak for the base. Well, this is true for many believers. Our struggles, our trials, the things that we're going through appear so much bigger to us than our God appears to be. And the reason for this is simple, because we're a lot closer to our trouble than we are to God. One of the things I love about old-time Pentecost 
one of the things I love about old time religion is when you come into the house of God and you come in and your trouble is on your mind and your struggle is on your mind and all that thing you're facing against seems so big because you're so close to it and then all of a sudden the Holy Ghost from heaven will come down and touch your spirit and all of a sudden God gets a whole lot closer to you than your trouble is and all of a sudden your trouble becomes small and your God once again becomes big hallelujah that's when you see saints start to dance that's when you see saints start to shout that's when you see saints start to leap when their God has once again drawn close to them and he looks bigger than their trouble does I miss church like that I miss being surrounded by people full of the Holy Ghost and full of faith who can help pray you through and help you once again get closer to the Lord so that your trouble, your struggle can shrink and look so much smaller than it appeared when you first came into the house of God. Oh my goodness. In John chapter 9, verses 34 through, 30, through 34 through 38, the word of the Lord declares, They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? The scribes and Pharisees are talking to a man who was born blind. Jesus created from dirt and spittle a little bit of mud and he put it on this man's eyes and he commanded the man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam and the man came back able to see a miracle had taken place and all of a sudden now the scribes and Pharisees have called this man in you know who did this how did this happen and the man began to share some things with him. And he's basically saying to them, I don't know how y'all can even think for a minute there's anything wrong with this fella. He didn't do anything bad. He did something good. And the Pharisees and the scribes respond to him. And they say, that was altogether born in sins. And dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Oh, no, but she play on that other. Oh, glory. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. Hallelujah. And he worshiped him. Oh, I'm going to tell you, finding that passive faith isn't quite so hard. Mary and Martha, Martha in particular in our story today, comes to Jesus and she acknowledges to the Lord readily that she has that passive faith. Oh, Lord, I believe in you. Oh, I believe in you, Lord. Matter of fact, I believe in you so strong, I believe that even now, even now, whatever you ask God for, it'll happen. The Lord says, well, Lazarus is going to rise again. And then all of a sudden we find out how real her active faith is <laughs> to believe God for the current circumstance. Well, yeah, Lord, I believe he'll rise again in the resurrection. Yeah, Lord, I believe in the rapture he'll rise. Yes, Lord. Mm -hmm. I believe the Lord. Yes, I do. Glory to God. Ooh, let's shout about it a while. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. 
See, her passive faith was in place. But her active faith was not quite there. <laughs> oh, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of believers. We go through things. We face struggles. We face trials. Tommy and I are going through some things right now. And I'm going to tell you, your active faith struggles. You have a hard time activating the faith you need. And I tell the truth to get over the hump that you're facing today. There's a difference between active and passive faith. The man who was born blind was questioned by the Jewish elders in his community after being miraculously healed by the Lord. After a questioning session, the angry elders threw him out of their presence, angry that he had supposed to teach them something when they arrogantly saw themselves as far more knowledgeable and qualified to teach. Hearing he had been thrown out of the synagogue, the Lord went to speak with this man. After a short conversation, this man was able to make the declaration, Lord, I believe. Oh, thank God he had found that place of passive faith. Glory to God. Amen. In Mark chapter 9, verses 17 through 24, the word of the Lord reads, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him. And when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked, Jesus asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But, is, but if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus saith unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now he's calling upon this man to find some active faith. See, now you need to believe, you need to be able to believe something more than what is necessary to acknowledge me as. Lord, You need to have some more faith in you than simply to understand who I am or what I've done for you in bringing you victory over sin. You need a little more faith than that. You need something else. You don't need that passive faith. That passive faith ain't going to help you here, son. I need some active faith now. Listen to the man's response. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Listen. Help thou my unbelief. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, he understood. Lord, I've got the act. I've got the passive faith. Hallelujah. But I need help with the active faith. Glory to God. Sometimes we need to talk to the Lord about our active faith. Hallelujah. We need to say, Lord, I need you to give me the faith to make it through this struggle. I need you to give me the faith to make it through this trial. I need you to give me the faith to make it through this tribulation. Because I'm sure struggling. I've got the passive faith. I'm going to make heaven my home one day. But when it comes to my current circumstance, that passive faith ain't cutting it. 
I need some active faith. And Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Hallelujah. There is nothing wrong with acknowledging to God that you're struggling with your faith. My goodness. The father of this child understood that his passive faith was well intact, but his active faith was struggling. We too can find ourselves in this position as the circumstance we face at the moment is overwhelming our confidence in the Lord's ability or His willingness to perform a miracle on our behalf. Many things can cloud our confidence and cause our faith to be compromised and it has nothing to do with our passive faith some will question how can you believe the Lord for salvation and yet not believe him for your current situation or circumstance but this line of questioning is foolish faith in Jesus Christ requires one level of faith and confidence in God the Word of God tells us that God Himself, listen, gives us the faith to embrace the Gospel. Isn't that what the Word of God said? You're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What is the gift of God? The grace? No, no. The faith to embrace the grace. The Bible said that God gives to every believer a measure of faith. We couldn't believe the gospel if God did not endow us with the faith to believe the gospel. That's his gift to us, which he gives us by his grace. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He gives that to us without us having to do anything to earn it. He gives that to us without us deserving it. He gives that to us free of charge. There is nothing we've done to merit him giving us the faith we need to be saved. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So therefore, some people, well, you can believe God to be saved. Why can't you believe God for all these other things? Um, because God gave me the faith to be saved. But He gave me a certain measure of faith. You see, in order to get that passive faith, I don't need a whole lot. But when I'm facing cancer... When I'm facing a lawsuit, when I'm facing a test in school, when I'm facing a job loss, when I'm facing a struggle, when I'm facing hunger, when I'm facing unpaid rent, when I'm facing my car being uh, taken away from me, all of a sudden my passive faith isn't working for me. I need something more. Oh my goodness. This father understood this. The Word of God tells us that God Himself gives us the faith to embrace the gospel in order to be saved. But we often fail to recognize that even in our current dilemma, we need to seek the faith to believe the Lord. As it is He who gives faith to those who will ask for it. There is no shame in saying, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. I know for me personally, as I pray for individuals who are going through struggles and trials, and this includes myself, I'll ask the Lord to help them to seize upon the faith they need so that they might be in a position to receive their miracle. If you've ever heard me pray, and I, I'm not saying I want you to sit around and listen to me pray, but if you've ever heard me pray, especially when I'm praying for somebody, in a, in, in, and especially if it's somebody I don't know, I don't know what their relationship with God is. I don't know what their walk with God. I don't know if they're even a believer per se. And as I'm praying for these people, you'll often hear me say, Lord, help them, God, to find the faith to seize upon that miracle which they need. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? What am I asking? I'm asking God to help them find the faith. Well, why am I asking God to help them find the faith? I'll tell you why. Because God 
conducts every transaction with man through faith. Everything God does in this world is accomplished through faith. If there is no faith, then there is no means whereby God is able to do anything. If you remember in the Word of God, the Lord was in His hometown. You know, He was in the area He grew up in. And the Word of God said, He could there perform no great work. What? The Lord couldn't do anything there. He couldn't heal the sick. He couldn't cast out devils. He couldn't raise the dead. Why couldn't He? It said He couldn't do any great work. Why? It tells you why. It says because of their unbelief. See, they knew Him. He grew up in their community. They look at Him. Wow, He's just one of us. We know that kid. I remember that kid. I went to school with that kid. Who does he think he is? And that was the attitude. And because of the lack of faith, God wasn't able to do nothing for nobody. Because everything God does, He does through faith. Therefore, if we're needing God, oh, I hope somebody's getting something out of this message today. I hope you're hearing what this old preacher telling you today. Therefore, if you're needing God to do something for you, instead of always asking God to do it, you need to stop first and you need to ask the Lord, listen to me now, Lord, give me the faith to believe you for this. Hallelujah. Give me the faith so that I can grab hold of the hem of your garment and get the miracle that I need. See, we don't think about asking God for faith, do we? It's interesting that the father of that demon-possessed child had enough sense to know I've got faith. But I need some more. Hallelujah. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Glory to God. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, the word of God reads, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, meaning to profit everyone. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, listen, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man, listen, severally as he will. Faith is one of the gifts of the Spirit. And we're not always running around with all the faith we need to face all the troubles we're going to face. <laughs> now, it doesn't work. That'd be wonderful if we had that. It'd be lovely if that were the case. But the Word of God said, God gives the gifts of the Spirit according to His will. He gives them to profit everybody. But if faith is one of those gifts, then what does that tell you about faith? That tells you, I need God to give it to me. Hallelujah. It's like putting gas in your gas tank. If you're going to get somewhere, you better go fill the tank first. Hello now. I need God to put faith. When I'm praying, I need to ask God, God, give me the faith. Lord, give me the gas. Glory to God. God, put gas in my tank so I can get where I'm trying to go. Hallelujah. Woo. Faith is listed as one of the gifts of the Spirit. And the gifts, we're told, are given by God at His discretion. We're encouraged to seek and desire the gifts that we might be a blessing and a source of encouragement to the body of Christ. Why then should it be a struggle to understand that as we face trials, 
struggles, sickness, or pain, that we ought to seek the Lord for faith to overcome and to prevail. There is no shame in having one's passive faith intact while struggling to find the active faith we need at the moment to confront our present circumstance. My Lord Hammers, I'm going to tell you, this is some good preaching today. I don't know. I don't know if you're getting it as good as I'm giving it, but I'm telling you right now, this, I, this is some preaching I wish I'd have heard growing up as a kid in church. I never heard this. No, I heard if you didn't have the faith, bless God, you ought to feel guilty. If you don't have the faith, bless God, you know, you ought to feel bad because there's something wrong with you. That's what I always heard. Self-doubt, self-condemnation, and low self-worth can all contribute to our inability to find the faith we need to receive from the Lord that which we require. Did you hear me now? Self-doubt, self-condemnation, and low self-worth can all contribute to our inability to find the faith we need. I don't know about you, but I know for a fact I've struggled with that in my life. Lord, I just I just can't hardly feel like God will do it for me because I'm just I'm failing him. I'm not living up to what I know I ought to be living up to. I'm not doing what I know I ought to be doing. I'm trying, but I keep failing, I keep missing, I keep messing up. God ain't gonna do this for me. Why should the Lord do this for me? But and we go through self-doubt, don't we? And I'm going to tell you, the enemy loves to come against our mind. He loves to use these things as tools in order to rob us. Jesus said, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I'm going to tell you, the enemy has stolen miracle after miracle from the people of God. He has destroyed Christians. He has destroyed their testimony. He's destroyed their faith. He's destroyed their lives. He's even caused many to go to their graves. All because he comes against them with self-doubt, self-condemnation, guilt. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I'm going to tell you, those things can work against your faith like there's nobody's business. But I got some good news for you today. I think you're going to appreciate this. I never understood what I'm going to preach to you today until God revealed this to me very recently. There's a reason why in the Word of God it tells us in Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He doesn't say who walk perfect. He didn't say who follow all the rules, who were able to be divinely perfected in the sight of God. That's not what he said. He said, if you're trying to follow after the Lord, instead of just living your life according to the dictates of your flesh, he said, then honey, there is therefore now no condemnation. Oh, hallelujah. God lets you know when self-doubt and self-fear and self-condemnation and guilt come against you, the Lord lets you know it doesn't belong there. Hallelujah. It doesn't belong there. The very thing that is preventing you from finding the faith you need doesn't belong there. Listen in Revelation 12, verse 10, the Word of God declares, And I heard a loud voice in heaven, saying in heaven, Now is come salvation, and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of the brethren, of our brethren, is cast down, which accused them before our God, day and night. The enemy is constantly coming against you and me. Word of God said he accuses us before the Lord day and night. 
And yet, the Word of God says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So God stands there and the devil's saying, oh, did you see what he did? Did you see what he did? Did you see what she did? Did you see what he did? And the Lord says, no, no, no devil don't have a clue what you're talking about. Oh, hallelujah. Honey, if that ain't enough to make you want to shout, I don't know what is. Glory to God. The Lord sits up in heaven and the devil constantly trying to accuse us before him. And our God sits there and says, Devil, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Man, that must drive the devil out of his mind. Can't you see? Mm -mm. Remember that message I preached about putting on Christ? <laughs> Remember when I talked about how we're not supposed to cling to Christ like we're clinging to another person, but we're supposed to cling to Him like we're clinging to a garment and don't let anything or anyone tear it off of us? God's in heaven. All I see is a little Jesus there. All I see is a perfect, wonderful child who does my will and does everything. I That's all I see. That's all I see. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, there's another truth you're going to appreciate today. Spirits of doubt, guilt, condemnation, and fear can all stand in opposition to our faith. It's imperative that we understand today, listen to me children, the role of grace in our lives so that we might approach the Lord with confidence and boldness. In Hebrews 4.16, the Word of God declares, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne, not the throne of God, but listen, let, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Get ready for a truth bomb, because it's coming. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are to come boldly to the throne of grace as children of God. If we understand that every action of God is born of grace, we no longer stand so much in our way when we're asking God for something that we need. See, all that self-doubt, all that fear, all that guilt, all that self-condemnation, we're letting ourselves get in the way of the miracle that we need. But listen, God is telling us today, listen, this is so important. I've never understood this till the Lord gave me this message. I, it never dawned on me till the Lord gave me this message. Grace plays a role in every single thing God does for His people. In as much as faith is necessary, Grace also is present. In other words, God don't do nothing for you because you deserved it. Even if you did deserve it. That's not why He did it. <laughs> Hallelujah. He doesn't do it because you're so good even if you are so good. That's not why He did it. There ain't nothing you've done, nothing you can do that could prevent God from doing it for you. Why? Because everything God does, He does through grace. Grace is unmerited, unearned favor. Hallelujah. And the Apostle tells us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy, listen, and find grace in time. Oh, when we need help. <laughs> oh my God, have mercy. 
God calls his throne the throne of grace. Why does he call it the throne of grace? Because it's plentiful there. Hallelujah. It's where grace is available. Glory to God. So every time we go to God and we have a need and we go to God and we're trying to believe the Lord and the devil's working against our faith, he's usually working against our faith by trying to make us a bigger part of the equation than we are. Oh, but you failed. Oh, but you've done this, or you've said that, or you... And he tries to make us bigger than we are. And the apostle reminds us, oh, no, 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 honey, when you go to God, you got to remember, you got to remember the role grace plays in all this. When you understand the role grace plays in all this, it takes you out of the equation entirely. Hallelujah. Because it ain't about you, it's about Him. Hallelujah. Wow. Oh, praise the name. I told you there's a truth bomb there for you. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are to come boldly to the throne of grace as the children of God. Every action of God is born of grace. Will the Lord do this for me? After all, if it is God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor, which is the very definition of grace that brings salvation, then we can appeal to that same grace for the miracle we need in our lives today. Oh, the best message I can ever deliver to you today, children of God, is this. It's not about you. <laughs> You are neither an obstacle, nor are you a stepping stone. You are a child of God. And you need to understand that we will always fall short of perfection. And therefore, we must always appeal to the Master's grace. Oh my God, have mercy. The apostles often spoke of the grace of God being with the saints of God. If you read all the epistles constantly as the apostle would greet the church in his epistles, he'd say, grace be unto you, grace be unto you. Constantly you read that in his greetings, in the greetings, not just Paul, but also Jude and um, Peter as well, but you'll see that phrase constantly being repeated. Grace be unto you. Grace unto you. Because that's how important we need to understand the role of grace in our daily lives. It's not just about grace of God bringing us unto salvation. It's about the grace of God bringing everything good into our lives that God has to offer. Hallelujah. When we understand that every transaction we seek to complete with the Lord is first based in His grace, it's easier to find the faith we need to receive what we need. We no longer fall victim to the spirits of doubt, fear, condemnation, guilt, as we understand that it is the will of God to do for us that which we require. Not because we've earned it or we deserve it, but rather because our God is a God of grace and love who mercifully does for those who have embraced the passive faith necessary to be made a partaker of salvation. Hallelujah. Once you've, once you've embraced that passive faith, <laughs> enough to believe God for salvation, once you've done that, God said, all right, baby, now you're on the roll. Now you're a child of mine. Now you can come boldly to the throne of grace. Now you can cry, Abba, Father, hallelujah. Now you can come boldly. And when you come boldly to my throne, don't you come with doubt. Don't you come with fear. Don't you come questioning yourself. It's not about you. It's about me. And honey, Everything you need, I'll do for you. Not because of who you are, but because of who I am. Oh, hallelujah. And I'll do it because of grace. Oh, my goodness, have mercy. What a wonderful truth today. In Ephesians 1, 2 through 6, 
the Apostle Paul writes, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and or even from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Oh, my word have mercy. I'm bringing it home. Matthew 7 11 says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them? That ask him. Passive faith is one thing. Active faith is another. But understanding today the role of grace in the lives of all believers helps us to find the active faith we need to receive the blessing, the healing, the miracle that we need today. The Lord is willing to do what we need for Him to do. Not because we are deserving, but because He loves us. And His grace is available to all who have believed on the gospel and who walk in passive faith. Hallelujah. It's the difference between passive and active faith. Those of us today that walk in passive faith, you may have a trial in front of you, you may have a struggle in front of you, that there might be something facing you that you're really having a tough time with. And I'm here to tell you today, it's available to you because we serve a God of grace. And secondly, there is no shame in declaring to the Lord, Lord, I believe, I have that passive faith. Help thou mine unbelief. Help me, Lord, to have the faith I need to seize hold of what I require. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Glory to God. Amen.